Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to start uh, verse 13. So let's go ahead and start reading right there. Um, and I'm going to read some scripture, and, and I might read all the way through this down to uh, verse 27, and then uh, we'll come back, and I'm going to start breaking some of this stuff down. But it says, Go in through the narrow gate, for the gate that leads to destruction is wide, the road broad, and many travel it. But it is narrow gate and hard. But it is a narrow gate and a hard road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And verse uh, 15 says, Beware of the false prophets. They come to you wearing sheep's clothing, but underneath they are hungry wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Can people pick grapes from thorn, bu thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every healthy tree produces good fruit, but a poor tree produces bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, or a poor tree, good fruit. Verse 19, any tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So, so you will recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do what my Father in heaven wants. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we expel demons in your name? Didn't we perform miracles, many miracles in your name? And then I will tell them to their faces, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. Verse 24, man, where did the love of Jesus go, right? So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like sensible man who built his house on the bedrock. The rain fell and the rivers flooded and the winds blew and beat against the house, but it didn't collapse. But its foundations was on rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like stupid, a stupid man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the rivers flooded and the wind blew and beat against the house and it collapsed and its collapse was horrendous. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shed some light on the house, building on the rock, sand, uh, probably that you've, you've never heard before. But I want to I back up, and I just want to read verse 13 um, and 14 again. It says, Go in through the narrow gate, for the gate that leads to destruction is wide, and the road broad, and many travel it. But it is a narrow gate and a hard road that leads to life, and only a few will find it. So I want to just take a couple of minutes and I just want to, um, and I was having a conversation with uh, a, f a couple of you before we began church today. And, um, and you know, we're, so some, uh, Don Farmer was just, you know, mentioning to me, you know, just how every day it just seems like the world just gets crazier and crazier and crazier. And, um, and I, we got news about this uh, just this morning, what I'm about to share with you. And I'm going to be completely, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to say the name and I'm going to be completely open because I think it's extremely important. Um, we're living in, we're living in the days where the Bible talks about that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. That even, even some of the people that we had great respect for and so on and so forth spiritually and as leaders that even that they would they would fall and and um, somebody that we and I'm not saying this person has fallen but I am going to tell you what happened and and what they said and what they did. Um, many of you know who John Hagee is. Ja John Hagee has been a, a huge proponent of the nation of Israel. He's done a lot of Hebraic teaching and so on and so forth. And um, we and we had like valid proof. We saw the whole thing and all. Um, if anybody wants to know where I saw that, I'll let you know after after the service. But this, what what happened was, is that there was a. And for, let me say this: there was a long time that he did teaching on and, ex, and exposing the the paganism, the paganistic roots in the Catholic Church. He he talked about all of the symbols, the the graven images, just the entire thing, the whole nine yards. And he declared that, you know, the Catholic Church itself has a lot of great people in it. There are a lot of people in the Catholic Church, uh, just like every church, you know, organization that has its faults and is not perfect. There are people who love Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There are people who follow after Jesus, who try to live their lives according to the scripture. So we're not we're not talking about that arena at all. We're talking about 
the, the papacy, the core of what the Catholic Church is. And, and for the longest time, John Hagee would talk about this. And then, of course, he was a big proponent of Israel. Well, it was just yesterday, I think it was, that the news came out. Um, yesterday that John Hagee wrote a letter of apology to the Pope and to the papacy for all of the years that he has preached about the paganistic roots. And not only that, but he went one, one step further and said that uh, the Catholic Church and the Jewish faith, the, the Jewish faith have got to merge, that the Jewish people have to come in to the Catholic Church. Yeah. And and uh, we were we were extremely uh, disheartened to hear that. But we actually saw the the letter and and, uh, and some of the, the interview or whatever else that he talked about this. And so I was just like, wow. And I'm telling you this for one reason, and it's not to be doom and gloom and it's not to be um, disparaging of. Of Hagee. It's not at all to do that. My point is that for for a while now, you guys have heard me talk about end times, and you've talked, you heard me talk about these things and the things that are coming and the things that are going to happen. And all I'm all I'm bringing this up for is to tell you I'm not crazy. <laughs> it is, and I know that's a little funny, but at the same time, seriously, y'all, there it is. There it is. It's happening and and further and further, we are as believers in Jesus uh, being marginalized and more and more there is a pushing for um, a one world, not only a one world order, but a one world religion, a one world religion. In fact, there are there are some things that are taking place even right now in some major religious organizations where they are doing. Tell me the name of it again. Tri Faith, and um, Tri Faith Bridges Faith Faith F-A-I-T-H-S. That's right. Okay, so Tri Tri Faiths and Bridges Faiths. So not singular but plural. And the whole, the whole campaign is, and this is getting ready to like go nationwide and churches, they're encouraging churches of all denominations to engage in this. And this, this campaign is to basically secularize and, and basically just melting pot every religion and every denomination that's out there to really bleed into what will eventually be a one world government. So there'll be a one world government and there will be a one world religion. And the papacy, the Catholic Church, is at the head of this movement. They are at the head of this, not just in America, but internationally. This is this is where this is going. And and so here I and here I am talking about things like this, and then we're seeing different things like this beginning to take place. Um, Don was telling me, Don Farmer was telling me that there was uh, a preacher, uh, a big time preacher here in America. He didn't tell me who it was, but just the other day came out and made a public statement that there is neither a heaven or a hell. And we already know that there, I mean, I, I, I know of one uh, major preacher. I've talked to this guy actually on the phone, uh, a major preacher that that came out years ago and said there was no hell. He was sort of at the forefront. It was, it was at uh, probably about 15, 20 years ago. And, uh, and since then, there have been a lot of other preachers uh, that have a lot of uh, vibrato. They've got a lot of push and shove. They got a lot of you know, influence on people and they have come out and said the same thing. And now we got somebody saying no heaven or hell. And not only that, but the Bible is just simply uh, a rule of thumb to live by while you're here on this earth and that when you die, you are nothing. You're just gone. Or no and, there, and that there is no trinity. But there, there's a lot of this stuff going on and it's all pushing into what will eventually be a one world government. Now, here's the thing. I, like, and in anybody who watches this video or anything else, like, I, you can find all of this stuff right here in, in the Bible. So, like, I don't, I don't want to argue with anybody about it or anything. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, 
if you don't believe it, then my, my thing is you don't believe the Bible. It's just as plain and simple as that. Yeah. And, and we're getting to the place very, it was slowly, and now it just seems like we're starting to, you know, Katie bar the door. We're running towards this whole idea that you can have your own opinion about the Bible. Now it's just a rule of thumb to live by and all this stuff. And little by little, there are very few of us who are willing to stand in a pulpit and are willing to say things like Jesus is the only way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the only way to the Father. He is the only way to heaven. There are few preachers who will stand in a pulpit and who will say homosexuality and lesbianism is a sin. The Bible declares it to be so not only in the Old Testament but in the New Testament. It is there. If you don't agree with it, you don't agree with God's word and you don't agree with him. It does not mean that Jesus did not die for them and that there is not a way of repentance, that there is not a way of salvation. But the sin has to be admitted. First yeah. yes. John chapter one, verse eight says, if you say you have no sin, then you are a liar Amen. and the truth is not in you. But if you say that you have sin then God is faithful and he is just to cleanse you and to forgive you from all unrighteousness. And there is not, and listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that you hear a lot of preachers say, but I'm going to follow it with something that none of them say almost anymore. And that is this, there is nothing that you have done in your life that God cannot forgive you from. There is nothing in your life that you have done that you cannot come back from, that grace cannot make a way. To say so would be to say that the blood of Jesus has a limit, that it has only a certain amount of power, but his blood is all powerful. There is no limit to his power. He can do anything. He can save anybody. But you have to first say, I am a sinner. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if we confess our sins, if we say that we have sin and that we confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord and he is the Savior, that he came, he's the Son of God, that he died, that he was buried, that he rose again, that he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and that he is alive for every more, evermore, we shall be saved. But I have to confess my sin, I have to confess who he is, and then ask him to be the Lord of my life. And once I do that, then I'm saved, Amen. okay? And it doesn't mean that we go around hating people who don't believe. We show the love of Jesus because the Bible says that the love of God covers a multitude of sin, okay? So we can't tell homosexuals turn or burn. If you know one, hug them. Tell them Jesus loves them. Right? Right? It's, it's the kindness and the gentleness that leads people to repentance. But at the same time, we are not going to stand in the pulpit and patty cake and sugar coat and milk toast mama boys this thing all day long. It's a sin. It's a sin. It's a sin. It's a sin. The Bible says it. I am still appalled by the fact that people support, I'm just on fire this morning, y'all. I'm appalled by the fact that people, I'm, I'm, I'm offended. Okay? That people will support the Muslim faith and they throw homosexuals off the top of buildings and behead lesbians in the streets and have dogs rape them. But when we just simply say it's a sin, we're evil people. But that's what the Muslim faith believes. That's what they do. And, oh, we can't say that about them because that's discrimination. That's hate language. But I can't, st I can't say that it's just simply a sin and that we love them. Do you see the anti-Christ spirit that is in the world today? All you have to do is stand on the side of truth and you will lose friends, you will lose jobs. We see it in the media. People are fired for their faith. You can be a Muslim, you can be a whatever, you can be a pedophile and run for office, but you cannot love Jesus and, have, and, and talk about it in the workplace anymore. 
And I'm here to tell you that it is, it is increasing. It is heating up. And I'm not doomsday because I'm, I'm not wanting to bring just a message that I'm saying, oh, it's getting bad. Oh, I'm here to tell you that it's heating up, okay, that it's going to get worse. And it's not, and, and you know the phrase, it gets worse before it gets better. It's just going to get worse. <laughs> Okay, it's going to get worse. And unless you know what you believe and why you believe it, and unless you are in this word, you will be able to fall and be deceived easily. But we have this hope. We have this hope. We know that First Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 18 says, And the Lord himself will descend with a shout, with a declaration from the archangel of heaven, from the armies of heaven, and he will descend on that shout in the glory of God. And those who are dead in Christ will rise up from the grave. And those who are alive and remain and are in Jesus will be caught up to meet him in the clouds. And forever shall we remain with the Lord. I'm here to tell you today, if you are standing on the side of truth, then we know what Matthew says. Matthew says, the narrow is the gate. Okay? I'm going to tell you, the, and you can see, I mean, you don't have, this ain't rocket science when we talk about some of the, we ain't curing cancer here or Alzheimer's. I mean, this is just some pretty basic stuff when it says this. It says, narrow is the gate and a hard road that leads to life and only a few that find it. How does that stand juxtapose to or side by side, if for you don't know what juxtapose is, juxtapose the, the, the prosperity gospel. It's, it's totally opposite. Yeah. It says, narrow is the gate and a hard road. All the gospel I've heard preached for more than 10 years now is, is rose petals and there's a bluebird on my shoulder and God wants you to prosper and this is your best day and success and there's success. Listen, success should not be our destination. Yeah. Significance, wow. significance should be our destination. Yeah. Success is what the world does. Significant, impactful is what the kingdom does. Yeah. How does how does if I sow a thousand dollars, you know, the more I sow, the more I'm going to get back from God. That sounds like a stock market. And the Bible tells me right here, it says narrow is the road and a hard road. It is that leads to life. I used to I used to and Melody and I. Still, sometimes we say it, but it seems like for the longest time, we've always tried to do the right thing and preach the right thing. And it seems like everything that we have ever tried to do is hard. It's hard. It's like everything is tough. It's just like everything is a fight, you know. And then you have Christians that tell you, well, you must have sin in your life. You know, and that's why it's hard. I don't find anything in the Bible that tells me that if I'm doing the right thing, that it's going to be easy. And that if I'm doing the wrong thing, it's going to be hard. In fact, the Bible tells me quite the opposite. And in fact, all of the disciples, I mean, for the love of Pete, who is who is not reading this thing? And then if I do the right thing, then it's just all going to turn up roses. Listen, Paul did the right thing and he spent a lot of time in prison. He wrote most of the New Testament in prison. Disciples got crucified. Up, they got stoned. They got ripped apart from lions. And we think somehow that if we follow after Jesus, it's just going to be, you know, I'm easy like Sunday morning. Yeah. Hey, listen, y'all, it ain't going to go like that. It's just not. If you are going to stand for the truth, you are going to be ridiculed. Right, that's true. I said this, I said this a couple weeks back, and I wasn't even trying to preach uh, because Tracy Stewart was here. But listen, if you, you know how you can tell people are the friends of the world and friends of God? You can tell, you can tell that if everybody likes them and everybody's around them. 
Watch out for the preachers who are friends with the world and all the movie stars want to be around them. And they're moguls and they got perfumes and clothes and everything else. But how, how in the world? Paul didn't have like Saint de la Paul. I mean, you know, yeah, you know, and Paul like is writing it at the end of the chapter. You can get my books and you can get my CDs and you, you know, and everything else. Listen, last time I checked, the word of God was free. First of all, I, yeah, that'll preach really good right there. Last time I checked, it was free. If I'm going to teach something that I think is a golden nugget from the word of God, I want you to have it so you can live better and not be deceived. Why would I charge you from something that I didn't even come up with myself anyway? And just, bah, I'm on it today. I, man, I just, but I'm so passionate about this. And it, and it, it is such a problem. And when I, then when I preach this stuff and then it goes on YouTube or Facebook, y'all, y'all, I got, and, and this is what I was going to say before. I got, I got friends and, and you stand in the truth. You will lose jobs. You'll lose friends. You'll lose family. You'll lose money. It will be hard. Nothing will be easy. But the Bible also says, Jesus himself said that for those of you who have lost friends, who have lost family, who have lost possessions, who have lost business who have lost you will reap it all back in the kingdom of God <clears throat> my reward is not here my reward for doing what I'm doing right now is not here I will not have recognition from men for preaching like this I won't I won't get invited on TBN. Charisma Magazine won't want to interview me. They'll want to stay away from me because I'm a weirdo. You know, and listen, and they wanted to stay away from John the Baptist too. Because he was out in the, in the wilderness with skins and he ate wild locusts and honey. But the Bible also says that he was a voice crying in the wilderness. Make his paths straight. Prepare ye the way of the Lord and repent. Am I saying I'm John the Baptist? No, I probably smell much better. <laughs> and I dress probably a lot bit better than John was. But what I'm saying is this, that if you're going to be like that, if you're going to stand in the truth, you're walking down a narrow path. If you're going to stand for Jesus in these last days, you're walking down a narrow path, a tough path. If you're going to stand for Jesus, there are going to be people around you you never thought would fall, and they're going to fall. Friends and family you thought were on fire for Jesus are going to fall. And then there are going to be those other people that you thought would go straight to hell and bust the gates of hell wide open. And all of a sudden, you're going to see them start coming up and coming out of drugs and coming out of alcoholism. Yeah. And coming out of the pits of hell and rising up and declaring the truth of God's word. And listen, you're going to be numbered either with the popular or you're going to be numbered with those who are weirdos. That's the way it's going to be in the last days. That's the way it is. Wide is the gate and narrow is the way. Why is the gate the destruction and narrow is the way that leads to life and few there are that find it. Few there are that find it. And, it's, and I've already kind of covered this, but in verse 15, this is beware of the false prophets. They come wearing sheep's clothing, but underneath they are hungry wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Can people pick grapes? That's a tongue twister. Can people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every healthy tree produces good fruit, but a poor tree produces bad. Listen, at the beginning of the chapter is where it says, judge not lest ye be judged. Okay. But then right here, turn around and tell me to be a judge of fruit. Okay. I'll know them by their fruit. Do you know why, though, there are so many charlatans that deceive so many thousands? Because they just take for what those guys say word for word and never bother to read this. You can't inspect fruit if you don't know what to look for, baby. You have to be able to know what his word says. 
<clears throat> if I don't know that the way to life is narrow and it's a tough road, then I'm going to think the wide road, right. the eight lane highway. Right. Well, everybody's on this. Let me tell you something, and I've shared this before. <clears throat> we all get on to Peter for denying Jesus three times before the, the chicken crowed. Y'all know that's why pastors eat chicken all the time, right? <laughs> we're just getting revenge ever since that, ever since that chicken told on us. We've been eating chicken ever since, and we, we're trying to get them back. That's a really bad joke. I'm sorry about that. It worked. It worked. But Peter denies Jesus three times, and we get on to him and everything else. But I'm going to tell you something. Give Peter a break because every one of us are in the same boat. That's right. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I believe at one moment of time when they started questioning Peter, I think he looked at the majesty of that temple. I think he looked at the, the, the majesty of all the robes of, the, of, the, of all of the, the rabbis and the scribes and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. And he looked at how organized they were. And then he thought about to himself, I've been on the road. We sleep on the ground. I've been following Jesus around. None of us are really dressed near as well as those guys. We stink a little bit compared to those. Those guys have shoes and many of us in our, in our bare feet. Which is a big deal back the, you know, then. Many of those guys are more educated than we are. We're educated, but they're far more educated. Wait a minute, maybe. And everybody seems to follow them and what they say. Everybody seems that if they say it, then it's just gospel truth. And I think for a split second, Peter started thinking to himself, maybe they're right. And maybe we're wrong. After all, just look at us and look at them. Maybe they're right. And maybe we're wrong. And that is my phone. It's always on silent. But, you know, this sermon, I'm not even going to edit that out. Maybe they're right. And maybe we're wrong. And it's going to be real easy to do that. OK, it's going to be real easy for somebody to look at this video on YouTube and say. And then look at some big preacher who's got 20,000 people and say, yeah. maybe he's right. Yeah. And maybe this bald headed guy's wrong. But if you know his word. And you are in his word and you are rooted and grounded in his word. Then you will know. And listen, I'm a, I, I'll probably talk some more about this next week. I'm going to let you go in just a second. But Jesus said this. He said, count the cost. Yes. Count the cost. If you're going to follow me, there is a price to pay. Nobody wants to preach that scripture either. I don't know if I've heard that scripture preached on in years. So count the cost. Jesus has given me money. I thought I was going to get a new house and a car. I got I to gotta pay to follow Jesus. Yeah, not monetary, but you're going to have to pay with in a lot of other ways. In a lot of other ways. And some of them are heartbreaking and some of them are sad. But at the end, there is life. If you think about your crown being in this life, you will be disappointed. But if you understand that your crown is in the next life, then you will be satisfied. You will be satisfied. But I'm here to tell you something. We've got to wake up. And this is where I'm going to, I'm going to jump down because I wanted to show this to you. He talks about all of these things. And he, and he says, you know, beware of the, of the false prophets. Um, <clears throat> and then he says, um, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, uh, you know, have we not done all these great things in your name? Have we not prophesied, expelled demons, and didn't we perform miracles? And then he will tell them to their faces, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. Yes. Of lawlessness. Now, a lot of people <clears throat> think, well, how could they have broken laws? But, because you're thinking in law in terms of the, 
the cops, the popo or whatever, you know, Roman police. How could they have broken laws and yet done the miracles and the works of God? Because it's not talking about, okay, it's not talking about man's law. It's talking about this law. When it talks about lawlessness right there, the, it's, it's talking about Torah, the mitzvot, the commandments of God. And when he says that they are lawless, he is saying they are Torahless. They have, listen to me, and I want you to hear this, guys. They have, because this is extremely, extremely important. They have the kingdom principles, but they don't obey the kingdom commandments. Yeah, they can go cast out demons. They can do all these things. They have kingdom principles, but no kingdom commandments. And what I mean by kingdom commandments is, you know, all the things that it says, you know, love your neighbor with all your heart. You love the Lord your God. All, whatever you can think of as a commandment, the Ten Commandments, all the other commands that Jesus gave to us, the commandments that are in the Torah. If you are without those commands in your life, then you are lawless. You are a rogue rebel in the kingdom of God laying hands on the sick when you don't even obey the commandments of God. You want to operate in his principle, in his power, and his authority, and his blessing, but you do not want to obey his commandments. Do you understand that that is the prodigal son? I want your benefits, but I don't want your rules. <clears throat> I'm preaching real good right now. And there, and this whole prosperity gospel says nothing about, watch this, okay? It says nothing about obeying God's word. It always talks about sowing seed. If you sow this seed, God will reap back on it. Sow this seed. If you will sow a thousand dollar seed. Listen, y'all, I sat in a sermon. I sat in a service. And I won't tell you this guy's name, okay? But I sat in a service where I heard him preach on Luke 2.52. It was a good message. And at the end of the message, I was live in the service, heard this guy. And if I told you his name, he's a household preacher name. I sat in the service, and at the end of the message, this is what he does. He says, there are some of you today that I want you to give a Luke 2.52 seed. I started going, where is the Luke, wait a minute, let me go back to the index. Luke 2.52 seed, where is that at? You know what? Couldn't find it because it's not in there. It's a bunch of garbage. It's a sermon designed to take an offering and shear the sheep. That's what it's designed to do. And this is what he said. Some of you can sow $2.52. Some of you can sow $20.52. Some of you can sow $252. Some of you can sow $2,252. Some of you can sow $20,252. I believe there are five men in here that can sow more than that. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. I bet so, because it's all going to go in your pocket before you fly home tonight. And, and li- y'all, I'm sorry. And listen, and listen, and here's the deal. And here's the deal. And everybody, and then there was 10 more minutes of preaching about sowing seed. All right. And then we're about to give. Hold on. The Lord's just instructed me to do something. And everybody stops. For all of you who can give $2,052 or more. I want you to come down to the front now. I'm going to pray a special blessing over you. Special blessing for the Luke 2.52 seed. Did you find it? Man, I can't find this anywhere. Special blessing for the Luke. My Bible doesn't have it. He must have a special blessing from a special Bible because it's not in mine. I got livid. I was with two other preachers and I said, hey, can you guys afford the blessing? Because I can't. <clears throat> and I'm going to be honest with you. This is exactly what I said. I guess God just like, Dave, you're a crap creep without a paddle, man. I just, you, you can't afford the blessing, so you stay in your seat. If you can borrow it from somebody, maybe you go down and get the blessing. 
I was mad as a hornet. You know what I did with my offering? And I had more than $2.52. I put it back in my pocket and I walked out of that building because I'm not dumb enough to let you rob me of my money when the Bible says nothing about sowing seeds for blessing. You know what it talks about? Obedience. And you know what they do? They'll turn around and say, well, then obey the word of the Lord and give. <laughs> the word of the Lord tells me to beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. The word of the Lord doesn't tell me anything. It tells me to obey his commandments. That if I love him, that I'll keep his commandments. That's what the word of the Lord tells me. That's where true blessing comes from. Listen, if my kids wanted to have favor when they were younger, you do what daddy says and he'll let you do what you want. Come on, is somebody in here. My son, if he would have walked up and said, listen, I want to buy some favor from you. I ain't done anything you told me to do. I'm preaching good right now. I ain't done a lick of any. I back talked my mama. Not only did I not clean my room, I threw more junk in the floor. And listen, pal, I'm not taking out the garbage. You can take it out yourself. But I'd like to offer you $50 to let me go to the arcade and do whatever I want to do today. I'd have backhanded him. And took his $50. That's right. <laughs> took his $50 and then said, go in there and clean that room and take that trash out. And do it. And go and tell your mama you're sorry. And then when you get doing and doing all that, come back, I'm gonna backhand you with the other hand, then you go into the room for the rest of the day. <laughs> and you know what? That's exactly what we do to God. Yes. We don't do anything he says. We try to operate in his principles and to get blessed. We say, if I give a thousand dollars to the man of God, God, will you bless me? I'm, I'm drinking like a fish. I cuss like a sailor. I cheat on my wife. I cheat on my husband. I do all this blah, 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 blah. But if I sow a seed, will you bless me, God? That is the church we're exhibiting. We, we look at and see today. And, I'm, and, and listen, here's the last part. So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on the bedrock. The rain fell, the rivers flooded, the winds blew and beat against that house, but it, but it didn't collapse because its foundation was on rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a stupid man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers flooded, the wind blew and beat against that house and it collapsed. And, it, and its collapse was horrendous. I want to submit this to you today. We've always preached that scripture on life being hard. My dog got ran over. I got fired today. My truck had two flat tires. My wife left me. My husband left me. But my house was built on the rock. And there ain't nothing wrong with that. But the instruction that I see that comes before that isn't talking about life. Have you all seen what I'm, what I'm talking about? The instruction I see before that is talking about Narrow is the way that leads to life. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Beware of false prophets who are like wolves in sheep's clothing. Discern their fruit. And then he says, and if you don't listen to these words, you're going to have a collapse. Yes. 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 But if you do listen to these words, you're going to be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Because here's the deal. The storm is going to come. What's the storm? Storm of deception. The storm of deceit, the storm of false prophets, the storm of, of our rights as Christians being taken away, the storm that comes against us as believers in Yeshua HaMashiach, the, the storm that, that beats against us and tells us, lay down what you have said before and take up this new world order. Take up this new, be like everybody else. Go down the wide highway. Don't be such a, don't be such a rogue. Be like everybody, conform. 
But the Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And listen, that storm is, is, is barreling down on us. It is. It's barreling down on us. And I've said this before, and this is where I'll end. I believe with all of my heart, I sense this. There, I'm not the only person. There are a lot of other people that are sensing this. Uh, I keep mentioning Don Farmer today, but I, we were talking a good bit, and he and I, and, and uh, Jamie Gambrell, even uh, before service. But I have this feeling, I have this sense that we are headed for something uh, in this world, in this not just in this country, but in this world that is going to be uh, fulfilling, fulfillment of Scripture that says that in this terrible time that there are people whose hearts, this is men's hearts, will fail them for fear. I believe that there is about to take place an event in this world that is going to bring great fear and great trembling, okay? And I really believe that it could be a natural disaster, but I don't want to predict that necessarily. But it's not going to be anything like we've ever seen before. It is not going to be Katrina, uh, you know, Hurricane Katrina. It's not going to be, you know, the earthquake of, you know, 1988 in San Francisco. I'm talking about something that will possibly uh, cost the lives of hundreds of thousands of people and displace millions of people and cause world economies to collapse. And this is what I believe. I believe that if I believe that's going to be symbolically the 30th day of Elul, which is the, the month of Elul is the month of repentance, the last day of that repentance. And it's going to be like if you don't repent after this, if you don't get woke up after this, there probably isn't any hope for you. If you don't see that the world is in turmoil, that it is groaning, and that the Son of Man, Jesus, Yeshua Hamashik, is close at the door, the trumpet is about to sound, you probably won't see it through anything. You probably won't see it. I'm not excited about that, and at the same time I am, because I know what comes on the other side of it. My Savior, my Lord, and my King. At the same time, I have an anxiety and I have a deep desire to tell everybody I can about Jesus. That's why I'm preaching so hard because the time for patty cake, patty cake church is over. It's over. It's done. And, and church as we know it is, I just read an article in Fox News yesterday. <laughs> Um, and I don't read many articles on Fox. I'm starting to get ill with just about every news outlet there is. But Fox News had an article about a mega church pastor who's not very well known, but a mega church pastor who is now telling, this is what he's saying. He's telling, he's telling good Christian people, this is what he's saying. You who are real believers, just leave the church because it's about to crumble. That's what he's telling people. Leave it because it's about to crumble and you're inside of a watered down mamby pamby gospel anyways. Get into your homes and start. This is what he told them. He said, start seeking God because something's getting ready to happen. This was in Fox News. I couldn't believe they posted it. Yeah. And I'm just telling you, man, it's people are starting to see it. They're starting to feel it. It's everywhere. And prepare your hearts that you say, well, what do we do? What do we do? Oh my gosh. Keep calm and tell people about Jesus. Yeah.